I'm always happy to stand in this pulpit because this is a place that I love dearly. And I love it because of you, members here, faithful, hardworking members, godly elders who are evangelistic and who are ready to stand for the truth, whether people like it or whether they don't. And because you put me in the pulpit, such as Brother Hatcher, who are faithful and true, and who will work diligently, and who are seeking to help men and women get to heaven. And I appreciate very much the things that were said. I feel I am the one that should be explaining to you my uh, happiness and my uh, joy that you gave me the opportunity to work with you. And any good that was accomplished was because of you. And I certainly do appreciate you. I appreciate Brother Harold Davis, and I was just thinking that I was about Tony's age when Brother Davidson and I talked, and uh, he encouraged me to go to Memphis School of Preaching. As a matter of fact, he said I had to. <laughs> <laughs> or worse to that effect. And I appreciated that. And, and I don't know if anybody's a better song leader than Brother Davidson. I love to sing when he leads singing. And so we've got started off in a great way. It's good to see all of you here, friends that I've known and, and some for many years and whom I have uh, loved and appreciated as well. I'm thankful that Brother Hatcher allowed me to choose my topic. At least he gave me that opportunity with his approval. And so I chose the text of 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 5, 1 because it is a text that is very encouraging to me. I like to preach about it. I like to think about it, I like to read it, and meditate upon it. And I hope that as we study it together tonight, it will be helpful and encouraging to you. We need encouragement, don't we? Well, we surely do. And while we have a lot of preachers here tonight, let me encourage those who are not preachers to encourage them. Preachers need your encouragement. I've known men that I think would be preaching today if they'd just gotten a little encouragement but instead they became discouraged and quit. What a shame that is. Men of ability. And they needed someone to help them, to lift them up. We need that. All of us do. We need encouragement. Well, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 5, 1 says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, I could sit down right now and we would have been encouraged if we listened carefully to what Paul, the great apostle, wrote to those brothers and sisters there in the church at Corinth. We live in a day when, uh, as never before, people have more and more things in life to enjoy, but more and more people enjoy life less. We have more possessions, but they have possessed us. There are some very simple passages that we need to understand. Luke twelve fifteen is one of them. Our Lord said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Now, how many people in America believe that? Not many. There are those who have hoarded great treasures thinking that is the way to have a happy life. But they've done that as they've traveled down that broad way that leads to destruction, Matthew 7, 14. So we need some help. We need some encouragement as to understand how we should live. Looking at things that are not seen, the things that are certain and eternal, instead of focusing upon those things that are seen, but are uncertain. 1 Timothy 6.17 Paul wrote to Timothy and charged him that he 
preach the gospel as he did in other places say so. I think eight times Brother Bland said the other day. Gave him charge. But here to those that trusted in uncertain riches. Then back in verse 10 of that same chapter, he points out that the love of money is the root of all evil. We're not to love the world nor the things of the world. 1 John 2, 15 tells us. Because if we do, the love of the Father is not in us. And yet that's the way that our world is traveling today. Looking to things. Things that we can see. Things that we can touch. Things that are material. Instead of focusing upon those things that are unseen. Those things that are eternal. We need encouragement to keep our eyes on those things. As we walk by what? By faith. And not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And so today, people are saying, is there not something more to life than this? Even members of the church are saying this. They've tried finding happiness in things. In looking to those things they can see with the physical eye, and they haven't found it. They have tried straddling the fence. And holding on to God and to mammon, it can't be done. Read Matthew 6, 24. And so they're looking for something. They're looking for the real answer to life. They're looking for fulfillment. And it's right there in the Gospel. I teach the book of Psalms in the school of preaching. And I especially enjoy teaching from Psalm 37 and 73. Both of those have to do with the prosperity of the wicked. And Asaph is the one who is credited with the writing of Psalm 73. And if you look at verse 3, he said, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now that doesn't happen today, does it? Why, surely it does. He looked upon the wicked and he thought, they're happy, they're healthy, they're wealthy. Their lives are undisturbed. Everything is fine with them. And why is it that way? And why am I not that way, he's thinking. As a matter of fact, look at verses 12 through 16. I have them in the book. He said, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He looked at the prosperity of the wicked. He said, well, I've done what I've done in vain. All I've got is chastening. I've been plagued. And they're doing well. But then he looked to the end of such a wicked life and saw the destruction that was coming. The world didn't see this. The world can't see this. Because it looks to those things that are seen, not the unseen. But Asaph finally saw it. He had been blinded to the reality of the unseen, but now he sees it in verses 17 through 28. He said, until... I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. He saw what would happen to them. Destruction, desolation, terrors. God is going to bring them to naught. And so he realized what was really important. It was not what he was seeing with his physical eye. The seeming prosperity of the wicked. That wasn't it. But when he saw how it really was, he said, I put my trust in the Lord God. And that's what we have to do. But we won't do that if we focus upon things that are material. You see, the things of matter are not what matters. They're not going to last. They're not important. Not ultimately. Not in the end. They're not the things that we need to be focusing upon. So we need to learn this lesson and we need to have the appreciation for this text and if we will, we'll have great encouragement from it. 
I want us to consider these points tonight. As Brother Parker did, we'll take about 15, 20 minutes for each point. First of all, first of all, if we look on these things that are unseen, we're not going to faint. Second, we're not going to fear. Third, we're not going to focus upon those things that are temporal. Fourth, we're going to instead rejoice in the renewal that is inward. And number five, in the reward that is eternal. And number six, we'll look for the revelation of that which is not seen. First of all, if we look on things not seen, we will not faint. Verse 16, for which cause we faint not. We're not going to give up. Because we grow weary. Because the way gets long. Because opposition is against us. We're not going to give up. Though the outward man is decaying, the physical man, though our outward man perish. Well, that's the way the outward man is. Sometimes people say, I see your hair is getting gray. I wonder what color they expect it to get. <laughs> I'm getting older. There's no question about that. Amen. Some have said, some asked me tonight and uh, about my wearing glasses. I told Brother Whitten, I'm not wearing glasses. I don't wear glasses. And he had to stop and look again. <laughs> Sometimes people say, I can see you're wearing glasses. I'm wearing glasses so I can see. That's the way it is. Our physical man deteriorates. It's subject to death and decay. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 tells us that. The dust shall return to the earth as it was. And so it's natural. That's the way it goes. That's the way it is. We shouldn't be surprised by that. We're facing death. Hebrews 9, 27 tells us it is an appointment that we will keep. Unless we're living when Christ comes back, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we'll be changed in a moment. But death is not something that should frighten us. It is but a doorway to eternal life. I was here just a few days ago and made mention of preaching a funeral of a brother who was 95. And he told his wife before he died he was ready to go home. He was ready to leave this place and go home. He understood what was home. This is not it. We're just passing through here. We're looking forward to going home one day. And death is the doorway that for the faithful child of God will lead to eternal life. Like Paul, we can say, if we live faithfully, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. But we see this process of aging and the deterioration that comes with that and the march that goes ever onward toward death. But we don't give up. We don't grow weary in well-doing and give up. We're not going to allow ourselves to faint even though the outward man perish. Because the inward man is renewed day by day. I've listed in the book of num a number of things that will help us not to faint. And I don't have the time to look at all of them. I would encourage you to do that later. But I want to mention especially one of them. That's prayer. Some of us have been told we don't believe in prayer. Well, I believe in prayer. I surely do. I believe God answers prayer. I know that He does because His Word says He does. Now, how He answers it is up to God. But I know that God answers prayer. 1 John 5.14 tells us that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And He'll answer that prayer. He told man to ask, Matthew 7.7, 7, Ask, and you shall receive. And James inspired, I believe, half-brother of our Lord, said James 4.2, that you have not because you ask not. And so prayer is the earnest approach of the inward man to the unseen throne of the unseen God. But the world looks upon prayer as something that is done by sissies, weak people. It's the pitiable cry of one who is feeble. And besides that, there's no one listening anyway. Because they can't see God with their physical eyes. They can't reach out and touch Him with their hands. They can't smell Him. They can't taste Him. They can't hear Him with their physical ears. And so they have decided, because these things are not present, that there is no God, and so it is useless to pray. 
First Peter three twelve tells us that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Well, he doesn't have ears like we have, but he has ears. In that sense that he listens to us. When we pray in accordance with his will, as those who are in fellowship with him, as children of his. So we faint not. There are many reasons why this is one of them. But I want to mention also that we don't faint just because of persecution coming our way. When troubles come, when people mock us, why the Lord was mocked and far worse. And we shouldn't expect that we'd get by without facing persecution. And when it comes, we shouldn't give up and say, oh, woe is me. Why, I'm being persecuted because I'm trying to live a faithful life. That's the way it goes. And when troubles come, people may say, well, where is your God? Why isn't He helping you? Why hasn't He delivered you? So we look around and say, I don't know. Maybe He is not here. No, that's not what we say. We still, like Asaph, trust in God. Put our trust in Him, we know that He is the One who has created the outward man and the inward man and has prepared heaven for us if we'll live faithfully. So we think of that inward man who's growing stronger every day even though the outward man perish. That inward man that is preparing himself for that place God has prepared for us. That place where we shall never die but live eternally, Revelation 21.4. And so we keep on keeping on. We don't give up. We don't give out. We don't faint. But we patiently endure. And more than that, we rejoice. And we can understand what Peter said when he said, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. 1 Peter 4, 16. If we look on things not seen, then we'll not faint. If we look on things not saying, we will not fear. Fear comes because of our looking upon afflictions with the wrong focus. I want you to notice, first of all, verse 17, that he said that our afflictions are light and they're momentary. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, they're limited by time. What is a vapor? As James says, and our lives are vapors. James 4, what is a vapor compared to eternal life? Matthew 25, 46. Why, there is no comparison. But we look upon things that we consider to be afflictions and we exaggerate them. They're blown all out of proportion. And the more we look at them, the bigger they get, the worse they get. I was explaining to a class at school recently, a homiletics class, about knocking on doors, and sometimes that can be a trying thing. I remember very vividly the very first door upon which I knocked as I was seeking to tell people about Christ, as I was a member there at the Adamsville congregation, Adamsville, Alabama. I could point out the house today. But anyway, I knocked on that door and, and a fella came to the door and there were two big dogs with him. They were big dogs. And uh, one on each side. And I was already scared enough and here were these two big dogs. I didn't know if they were a friend or foe. But I was explaining that to the students and one of the students, one of the smart Alex students, you know, <laughs> said, well, you know, those dogs might have been chihuahuas. And you just thought they were huge. Well, that may be. <laughs> and that's the way that it works sometimes. We see a chihuahua and we think it's a huge thing. Because fear magnifies afflictions. And fear cripples the church. Just think what we could do if brethren weren't afraid to do what God said to do. The way God said to do it. Well, we could go out and preach the gospel. We could go out and reach folks if we weren't afraid of what might happen or that we might make a mistake or something like that. The biggest mistake is not going. 
A lot of times I talk with men who come to the school and talk with me as I'm the dean of admissions there. And they state their desire to preach. But you can just see the fear of the hound. Well, I understand something about that. They're afraid of leaving home. I understand that. Afraid of leaving family. We know about that. Leaving a good job, maybe. And I understand about that. Afraid of trusting in brethren to support them. And also of, of raising that support. And so as I've done that many times, talking with different ones, I've seen that this perhaps is the greatest fear of all. And you know what happens sometimes? Those men think about preaching and they look at all the obstacles before them and they become too afraid to commit themselves to preach the gospel. But I tell every one of them the same thing. If you'll commit yourself to do God's will, God will bless you. God will bless you. And so you just commit yourself to do God's will and you trust God to take care of the blessing and you just go ahead and do what you ought to do. And when they do that, then God does bless them if it is what God's will is, of course. He does bless them. The apostle of love, John wrote, there's no fear in love, but love casteth out fear, 1 John 4.18. If we look on things not seen, we're not going to faint. If we look on things not seen, we're not going to fear. If we look on things not seen, we're not going to focus on the temporal things of life, whether good or bad. We're not going to be singing, nobody knows the troubles I've seen, nobody knows my trials, feeling sorry for ourselves and things go badly, nor will we be trusting in uncertain riches. We're not going to focus on the temporal things of life. Notice what Paul had written in the preceding verses to our text. He said, We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Now if Paul had focused upon temporal things, he might well have concluded that life stinks. Look at all the problems he had. The troubles he faced. The persecution that was his. He might have well said, this is not what I want. But he didn't do that. He said, our afflictions are light and they're momentary. But how heavy sometimes we seem to think they are. We must not focus on things that are temporal. I saw not too long ago where a tornado had hit in some high-scale neighborhood and blown this man's house to a million pieces. He had expensive cars and paintings and things that he collected and they were all gone, torn to shreds. And he was looking at that uh, sad scene, and it was sad. And he explained to the reporter that he at first looked at it and thought, I've lost everything. But then, there beside him were his wife and his two children. And he realized he had lost everything. While the ones that mattered most in his life were right there. They were safe. And so for the first time in his life, he saw there was something more important than things. I think it was a blessing that he was able to come to that realization. Well, there's a finality to the temporal. It's only temporary. Ultimately, it will be gone. Everything that we see is going to be gone one day. And it's not going to matter 
when that time comes, is it? It's not going to matter whether we lived in a fine house or we lived under a tree somewhere as far as that goes. What kind of car we drove, what kind of clothes we wore. Ask the rich man, Luke 16, 19 through 31, if it matters. You could ask him tonight. He's still in torments. He'd tell you it didn't matter. It wouldn't matter now. It wouldn't matter as far as what he had then because those things were not important. And so we need to focus on things that are unseen, not the things that are temporal. We take our eyes off Jesus and start looking around at the world around us, we'll be like Peter who sank, Matthew 14 30, when he took his eyes off Jesus. So we need to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth, Colossians 3, 1 and 2. We know there's more to life than just the temporal. Well, while we look on those things not saying, we'll be encouraged by a renewal that is inward. We look in the mirrors and we see that we're aging, we're getting wrinkles, our hair is turning gray, or maybe it's turning loose, and our muscle tone is going, and so on and so forth. We're getting feebler. Our bodies are marching toward the grave where they'll sleep. So we'll return to God, Ecclesiastes 12.7. And so we look at ourselves in the mirror and there is that outward man who's perishing. But if we're living faithfully in Christ, it ought to be the case that we look in the mirror and we see the outward man perishing, but also we realize the inward man is getting stronger every day. Our spiritual muscles are getting bigger. We're becoming more robust spiritually. That inward man is the one that's growing. The spirit within man, James 2, 26, as Daniel said within the midst of his body, Daniel 7, 15, which comes from God, the Father of spirits, Hebrews 12, 9. So our outward man is perishing, but the inward man is getting stronger every day. And so when our bodies finally give up one day, and they will, the inward man doesn't. He's preparing himself to live. The body's going to die. Go back to the dust. But that inward man's going to live. And live eternally. Live in that blessed place of heaven. Well, we can't see this inward man, can we? But we know he's there. The Bible tells us he's there. And we can see the result of his being there. In that our bodies are animated. We're living. James 2.26 again. And we can see how this inward man is expressed through our words and deeds. Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth that speaketh. Matthew 12.34 The wise man said, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23.7 And we know that when we give that account before Christ, when we stand before Him in that judgment day, 2 Corinthians 5.10 we're going to be judged according to the things which we have done in our bodies, whether those things be good or bad. So we're looking forward to this renewal that is inward. That ought to be great encouragement to us. And I've seen this so many times in brethren who are going on across that uh, unseen boundary Stepping from time into eternity. Their bodies have worn out. But their spirit is strong and ready to live. If we look on things not seen, we'll be encouraged by a reward that is eternal. Paul said, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us. That word indicates it equips us. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Peter put it this way. He said, There is an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 3, 3, 5. This reward is eternal, but again, it's not seen, is it? It's not seen. None of us have seen heaven with our physical eyes. 
And so we can't say, well, I, I can tell you about heaven because I've seen it. But we know that there is heaven to be gained. We know that it is eternal and that it is the place where we'll receive, if we live as Paul said he did, a crown of righteousness, a crown of life, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. And so that which we must seek and upon which we must fix our eyes is that which has real weight to it. It's not light like our afflictions. It is weighty, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I hope you'll read 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27 and see how Paul described the suffering that he had to undergo. How that he was beaten with uh, rods. Five times he received 40 stripes, save one. Was stoned three times, or was stoned and then three times suffered shipwreck. And the other problems and perils that he faced, and you read that and you think, well, man, that's too much. Paul didn't say it's too much. He says it's light. It's momentary. There's something that has real weight to it. And that is that reward that is reserved in heaven. That reward that is eternal. And then lastly, if we look on things not seen, we'll be encouraged by a future revelation of the unseen and eternal. Verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now we know there's a place where God dwells. We haven't seen it. Haven't seen God. We know that Jesus ascended there. He's there this very moment. We haven't seen Him. We know the Holy Spirit dwells there as well. As do the heavenly hosts, the created beings, the angels. We know that there will be that place where all the faithful of all the ages shall gather and shall be with one another in joy for eternity. We know there is the tree of life. We know there also is that river, the pure water of the river of life. No graves there. The wicked will be excluded, Revelation 21, 27. No sin there. And yet we haven't seen any of these things with our physical eyes. But those are the things that really matter. That's why Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, Matthew 6.33. That's why He said that a man, if he were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul, he hasn't profited, Matthew 16.26. The things that are really worth something are not things we can see here. They're not material. They're not temporal. We've got it upside down. While the world is saying the things that matter are material. So grab all that you can and hoard them up. But Jesus said moth and rust will corrupt them. Thieves will break through and steal. Matthew 6, 19-21. Those things are not important. Not really. Not ultimately. Not eternally. Well, is there any doubt about the reality of these things not seen? Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Paul said, we know, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. How did he know that? By revelation from God. How do we know it? Is there any doubt about that? There's not any doubt about that because God's promised. And God will not lie. He'll keep His word. And so we can look forward in hope, Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life. Notice this, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So we look to things that aren't seen and we know they're there. Hebrews 11 tells us that as well. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We look by the eye of faith on unseen things and we're encouraged. There is great reason for rejoicing. There is hope. There's more to life than this. There's heaven to be gained. There's eternity with God and all the faithful. So keep in mind these things are reserved, though, for those who do not faint, those who do not fear, 
Those who do not focus on things that are temporal. Those who remember that we have a renewal of this inward man. A reward that is reserved and a revelation of those things unseen that is yet future. So we need to live in view of eternity. Not in view of things today. Look toward eternity and prepare ourselves for it. If we'll do that, then when, if time were measured in heaven this way, when a million years have gone by, it will only have just begun. And all that it cost us, all that we had to give up, all that we had to do, all that we had to forsake as far as the things of this world, well, we'll look at all that and we'll say, heaven is surely worth it all. And we'll not regret for one moment that we set our focus on things not seen. If you'd like to begin that life today, that life of living in hope, that life of being a faithful child of God who can expect heaven after a while, you can do it. If you'll believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, John 8, 24, and repent of your sins as Peter told those on Pentecost, Acts 2, 38. Confessing your faith as the eunuch did, Acts 8, 37, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you can be baptized into Christ this very night, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. And we'll be happy to help you do that. It will be the most important decision that you have ever made. Maybe you've done that and not continued faithfully. You've taken your eyes off the things that really matter. You need to focus again. Come back. Do so right now while we stand inside.